What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekaWatt video. In this video, I'm going to be showing you guys how to put together quite possibly the cheapest gaming PC you can build as we head into 2022. I've picked up some of the best value and most affordable components on the market to see what results you're able to achieve from a system that costs less than $500. This video it's going to be an interesting one. I'll be coming back to the case, power supply and graphics card later, kicking things off by discussing these components here. Our CPU, RAM, storage and motherboard. The beating heart of this build is AMD's Ryzen 3 3100. It's their cheapest Ryzen 3 chip uh, from the latest Ryzen 3 lineup. A quad-core CPU with some decent clock speeds that delivers pretty good single and multi-threaded performance. I'll be coupling this up uh, with 16GB of RAM from Corsair, specifically their Vengeance RGB RS. Truth be told, any 8 or 16GB kit you can pick up for this build is what you want to go for, but with it being a Ryzen system, make sure you go for 2 DIMMs for all the extra bandwidth that more RAM DIMMs will afford. I'll be installing both of these components into the motherboard, best described as the skeleton of any gaming PC build. And this right here is the Gigabyte b 450 ms 2 h widely regarded as possibly the best value, most affordable B450 motherboard. You still get support to overclock your memory up to its rated speed, crucial for Ryzen, a CPU architecture which likes fast memory, and room for a full length graphics card and M.2 super fast SSD if you choose to install one. Installing the CPU in this build is the same as any Ryzen system we've seen in years. Go ahead and pick up your processor locating the little golden triangle on the bottom left of the chip. You want to line this up with the triangle on the top left of our CPU socket and proceed by pulling up the retention arm on the motherboard and dropping the chip into place. Give it a little bit of a wiggle and then you can return the arm and that's basically all there is to it. I'll come back to the cooler in a moment as this is actually quite an interesting choice, but first the RAM or the memory. And now as I say, 16 gigabytes really is the ideal amount of RAM as we head into 2022 and eight gigs is increasingly becoming a bottleneck, even for lower end CPUs and GPUs. This motherboard only has two slots, so we'll simply be using both of the slots on the board itself and installing the memory by lining up the gold contact strip with the RAM DIMM slot. It is notched, so won't go in this way, only uh, one way around, and don't worry if you get it wrong. It just won't install, flip it round, and you can install it nice and easily. This RAM also has RGB, which will add a nice aesthetic twist to our build today, and can be configured in Corsair IQ, with lots of different color and animation options. Cooling is provided by the AMD Stock Cooler. Now, one of the massive advantages of AMD processors over their Intel counterparts is this bad boy. It comes included for free, meaning you haven't got to go out and spend $30 on an aftermarket unit. That's not to say aftermarket coolers are a bad thing. They're not. They're just expensive and something which in a build like this we could really do without. These typically will come with pre-applied thermal paste on the bottom, but because ours has been used before, we need to drop just a dab of our own on around the size of a grain of rice before screwing the cooler in. Wire up the fan to the 4-pin fan header and your CPU, cooler, RAM and your motherboard are all pretty much done. We're then able to move our completed motherboard assembly, as we'll refer to it, into the case for this system. Now a massive shout out to Techware, who sent out their brand new Nexus M2, a super budget oriented case that still has really good ventilation and a tempered glass side panel, but doesn't break the bank. For my American viewers, try and pick this up if you can, but if you can't, I'll leave some alternative options linked below based on one of our recent videos where we looked at some of our favorite 10 cases of this year. It definitely needs a refresh with some of the brand new Techware stuff out on the market though, so make sure to get subscribed for a top 10 cases 2022 edition. Oh yes. I often find that smaller cases as well can be easier to build in for a first time builder as they definitely tend to simplify things down a bit and are less overwhelming, especially if you've never built a PC before. At the rear of the chassis, you'll see an included bag, which is nicely cable tied to the rear of the case. This includes all the screws and the other hardware we need for our build today. So if you're wondering how to screw the power supply of the motherboard in and where they come from, they'll be included in your case. So keep your eye out and grab these out. You'll also find some cable ties in here as well, which we can handily use later on for cable management, helping us to keep our system looking fresh. Just because this is a budget build doesn't mean it has to look bad. Spinning the case around to the rear and you'll notice a rectangular cutout on the top left hand side. This is actually for this, the motherboard's rear IO shield. This is what creates the link between the ports on the back of the motherboard and the back of your case. 
It snaps into the rear of the chassis very, very easily. Just a little something like so with our audio ports. That's the three circular ones oriented towards the bottom. Once we've done the IO shield, we can go ahead and screw in the motherboard. But before you get all hasty and do that and find yourself in a spot of bother, take your motherboard, flip it round and locate each of the standoff holes. These are the holes that we'll be using to screw the motherboard into the case. And the location of these is really, really important. They need to match up with the standoffs installed in the chassis. So for us, we've got two at the bottom, two at the top and two along the middle. These, by the looks of things, actually match up completely perfectly out the doors, which is quite rare. That means that if you're using this exact motherboard and case combo, you can very, very easily slide your motherboard in without needing to worry, basically, at all. Push the ports through the rear IO on the back of the chassis, like so, uh, and then screw the motherboard in. I think today I'm gonna lay our case down flat, Really, really useful to actually secure this down. That way the motherboard's not trying to fall while we're screwing it in and it makes our life that little bit easier. At this stage of the build, I would usually go ahead and install the power supply, but today I'm gonna do the GPU first because it also gives me a good opportunity to discuss with you guys exactly what I was thinking with this GT1030. Now, just a couple of years ago, this exact GPU was seen as a bit of a joke amongst the PC gaming community. It works okay at 1080p uh, in games like Valorant, Apex, and Fortnite. But apart from that, it's just not all that strong. In the current GPU climate though, the 1030 has a whole new place in the market. RTX 3000 series cards are basically impossible to buy, and the likes of a GTX 1660 Super or 1650, while available, are very expensive. The 1030 seems to be one of the only cards unaffected by this, and I'm not going to sit here and proclaim that it's the perfect GPU for all of the viewers on the channel. That would simply be untrue. If you want to play the new Battlefield 2042 at 1080 or 1440p high settings, this isn't the card for you. Same with the new Forza Horizon 5 or Call of Duty Vanguard. But if you're big into Valorant, Splitgate, CSGO, Apex Legends, Fortnite, then you should definitely consider a GPU like this. And at very least, it will do a good job of tying you over for 12 or 18 months until GPU stock returns back to normal. And you can slot in a 3060 to this system without upgrading any of the other components and not have too many issues. The thing is, even if you went for a 1660 Super now, you'd probably pay three times its market value. And when you come to sell it in two years time, you'll never get any of that money back. Here, you're simply going to lose, what, $80, $90 if you don't sell it, or $50 if you do, making it a bit of a win-win, in my opinion, if you're playing the right games. We talked about this more uh, in a separate video, which I'd urge you to check out. Now, you can get this card in a couple of different variants, a DDDR4 or GDDR5 option. Go for the GDDR5, the much faster video memory will help your performance by a good margin. And what about those of you going, why didn't you go for an APU? If you check that video out I just mentioned, you'll see this outruns AMD's Ryzen 5600G in the vast majority of instances. Yes, it surprised me too. I'll be installing this GPU into the top PCI slot, meaning we just need to take out uh, the third cover on our case, or the second from the top. In this chassis, you do that simply by wiggling it out and it snaps off its two metal points. Might take a few seconds, but be gentle as you don't want to damage the motherboard before removing our rear PCIe retention cover. So go ahead and unscrew this one as well, which will allow you to slot the GPU nice and easily into place. There we have it. It will make a nice satisfying sound as well once it's been installed and we can secure it back down with the same screw that we removed just a moment ago. Nice. Our simple but effective budget system is really starting to come together. Save for one component, the last part we need to install. No, wait. Two components, we have two components left to install. The first of those is the power supply, Cooler Masters MWE 500, a super budget 500 watt unit that still has an 80 plus certification and power cables for a future GPU upgrade. Of course, if you wanna go ahead and pop in like a 3070, which you probably shouldn't do anyway, then this power supply isn't a good option long term. But for now, it's budget credentials and good efficiency alongside decent reviews make it a nice choice. We can slide it into the rear of our case with the fan facing down to pull in fresh air from underneath and secure it down with four screws, one in each corner. Once you've done that, you can power up the CPU with the CPU power connector in the top left of the motherboard. 
the motherboard with a large 24-pin motherboard power cable on the right-hand side, and a Molex cable to power all the fans and any RGB lights that we might have in a case like this one. While we're on the subject of cables and wiring, now is also a good opportunity to plug in all the fiddly front panel connectors. Our JFP1 is first up. These are the little pins and we'll pop a diagram on your screen now to make it easier. These go to the bottom uh, right hand side of the motherboard. USB 3 is next. These are for our USB 3 connectors on the top of the case and this is the largest front panel cable of the bunch. Finally, the last one uh, is our HD audio connector which powers up our separate headphone and mic jack. This goes to the bottom left of the motherboard, has a pin blocked out, so it will only go in one way round. Don't force any of these connectors. If you have a few problems with them, take it slow. Check these instructions once again. You don't want to damage these pins, as that can cause you a few problems later down the line. For now, though, it is finally time to install the SSD. Now, to do this, we need to spin the case around to the rear and locate this, our SSD sled. This is what we'll be using to install the drive into place and it unscrews nice and easily. You then want to take four of these small screws and actually fasten the SSD drive into the sled before powering it up with SATA data like so and SATA power. Remember the other end of your SATA data cable plugs into the motherboard to create the link between the two things. And once that's done, our system is, well, it's basically complete. But the video doesn't end there. In this video, we'll also be showing you how to install Windows, your BIOS and all your drivers, getting the system ready to go before testing it out with some of those titles we discussed a little bit earlier. Before any of that though, it's time to see just how good this system looks when it's all powered up in an epic glam montage. I'll see you in a second for the performance and Windows and all that jazz. But first, roll that montage. The next stage of the build is to go ahead and install Windows, get our BIOS configured and sort out all of the drivers. To do this, you'll want to go ahead and grab yourself one of these, a bootable Windows USB drive. Essentially pick up any 16 gig USB 3 stick off Amazon, links will be in the description below, and then use the official Microsoft tool to turn it into a bootable Windows USB. You want to go ahead and just plug this into the rear panel of your system itself, turn the power supply switch on and hit the power button. As the fans on your PC start to spin, you want to hit the delete key on your keyboard, which should already be plugged in. Make sure you connect it up to a monitor with a cable that you know works, and then wait for the system to dive into the BIOS. Here you can see we're in our Gigabyte BIOS, and there's a couple of settings we need to configure. The first is we need to head down in the MIT tab to Advanced Memory Settings. You want to go ahead and enable XMP, and then it should automatically tune your memory up to 3600 MHz. 3600 MHz is important for a system like this and is the rated speed of our Corsair memory. It just means our Ryzen processor gets that bit more bandwidth and is an important step. You then need to go ahead and navigate over to save and exit, but rather than clicking save and exit itself, jump down to your boot override and go ahead and select the USB option. If you've got multiple USB sticks installed, this will be more complicated, so unplug the drives you don't want to use and hit enter. It will then ask you if you want to save the configuration. We do, otherwise our memory settings will revert, and then we should dive into the Windows installation process and be greeted with a screen of purple in three, two, one. Here we go, lovely stuff. So you can see here, we can go ahead and select all of our languages and region settings as part of the Windows installation, and then click install now. The process can be quite long-winded, but I'm gonna walk you through it step by step, so bear with us. First, you want to enter a product key, or if you don't have one, click I don't have a product key. That's also completely fine, and you can just activate Windows by logging into your Microsoft account later, selecting Windows 10 Home, agreeing to all the license terms and conditions, choosing to install Windows only. We haven't got an existing upgrade uh, to do. Then going ahead and picking which drive you'd like to install Windows on. So for us, uh, we've got our SSD that is unallocated, meaning there's currently nothing on it. But if yours does have information, you can format it at this stage of the process. 
Once that's done, it will automatically reboot into your new Windows SSD, and you just need to go through and select your region, add any keyboard layouts, uh, and agree to any of the Windows terms and conditions. It is really is a case of just clicking yes, no, yes, no, in whatever order you see fit. But a top tip here, don't connect any internet up yet, do that later, because if you leave the internet off, you'll skip all the Cartana rubbish, uh, which makes things a lot, lot quicker as far as the process is concerned. Nice, we're now into Windows and there's just one or two more things left to go. The first thing you want to do is head into the internet browser. We're going to use Edge uh, just for this stage because it comes pre-installed to install the graphics card drivers. Something which is important to do, even on a budget system like this one. The drivers we need to install can be found by searching for GeForce Experience. This is the universal software that NVIDIA actually provide for all of their graphics cards and will automatically detect and keep updated at the drivers for your system. These are crucial and really, really do improve the performance metrics that you're able to expect from your system. So we're just going to wait for that to go ahead and download. It is a rather large file, so it can take a bit of time, and then we can run through the driver installation. While this is downloading, it also makes sense to go ahead and download the AMD chipset drivers. This is just for your CPU, and while it's definitely not as necessary as your GPU, it's always handy to have, and you may as well do it. The AMD software is also really clever in that it will just automatically detect what hardware you've got and then install appropriate CPU and GPU drivers where relevant. Once these have been done, we're pretty much good to go on the driver's front and can boot up some games to see how well the system performs. On your screen now is a brief summary of the results we were able to gather with this system, but as always, we'll be diving into more detail looking title by title, starting things off with GTA 5. In this title, we achieved an impressive 80 frames per second on average when we tested using the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode at 1080p normal to medium settings. The 1030 actually really, really impressed me here and showed that even at medium settings in select titles, it can still perform really well. Forza Horizon 5 was next up. Here at 1080p low settings, tuning things down a little bit, we achieved just shy of 40 frames a second. A much lower FPS result here, but nevertheless still pretty playable for a racing title, a game where frame rate just isn't quite so important. Moving on to Apex Legends, and here our mileage was slightly better. Once again, testing at 1080p, tuning some of those settings down, we got 46 frames per second on average. While not quite the 60 FPS that you might dream of, it's still actually a pretty decent result as far as how budget oriented this system is. And a couple of years ago, you wouldn't be getting more frame rate than this around this price point anyway. Valorant is next up, and this is a game though where the 1030 does really impress. A title where frame rate is a plenty, we got 170 FPS on average at 1080p medium. That's competitive esports level frame rates in a build that costs you under $500. As if that wasn't enough, we also tested out Fortnite and got some impressive results here too. At 1080p competitive settings with everything tuned down to low and the render distance set to far, we got 70 frames per second on average, with 90 and 99 percentile results that didn't really deviate below that 60 FPS mark. To wrap things up, we also tested out CSGO and here at 1080p achieved 120 frames per second. With the 1030, it's all about what kind of titles you want to play. If you're after those easier to run FPS games and a couple of racing titles, then it really will impress. But if you're looking for a card for the new Halo or of course Cyberpunk, then your mileage is definitely going to vary. With that though, that pretty much wraps it up for this video. If you did enjoy it, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.